we experience a lot of gun violence and, there, and Asian hate is real. Um, and when there was the shooting in Boulder at the grocery store, I lost a dear friend of mine. Her name is Lana. And um, it damaged my community. We are still grieving and missing Lana to this day. And so shortly, or just even with like the Asian hate crimes and the shootings, I've been really triggered um, by that news and gun violence in America. But specifically around Asian hate, I remember after, you know, some shooting somewhere and it was all Asians, I was really like just depressed, sad, crying, couldn't shake the funk, feeling really unsafe. And I used um, a psilocybin. And when I do that by myself, I have an intention when I, um, before, and I really kind of center myself and I ground myself and I have like kind of a meditative process um, and an intention. And my intention was to really, you know, know that I'm loved, know that I'm safe. Uh, and, it, and really to help just this like really depressive state that I was in of being feared, you know, um, you know, to be a victim of crime, that people hate us. And so that was really just really beneficial for my mental health and psilocybin helped me like just recently also you know come out of that psilocybin can help heal you know trauma you know it can help get to the root of sometimes our own trauma. It can address um, transgenerational trauma, trauma that we don't even know we have, but is passed down. And so I've sat in lectures and even like, um, have learned how, you know, psilocybin can also help with racial trauma. And if there's, you know, something that's naturally growing out of the ground, that's not toxic, that's also been used within, you know, indigenous cultures for thousands of years. I believe it is our right to have access to this and to be able to grow it and to treat it not like this fear drug, you know? And so I, feel, I find that's like just very important that the potential that we have with this medicine can help, you know, the BIPOC community very much um, in ways that, you know, we don't really even know yet because the research isn't out there because of its schedule one status. And so I'm really grateful for the study to be able to highlight perspectives of the BIPOC community. We don't have opportunities like this really ever to just be like featured. If you look at who shares the stages speaking on this topic, it's not people that look, you know, black and brown. And so I hope that this is a start of how we can further, you know, destigmatize and that it inspires people to also be an activist, to be an advocate for their own self healing and community healing with, you know, psilocybin and natural, you know, therapeutics and medicines. In 2019, I attended the first ever psychedelic professionals meetup hosted by this NOAC Society. And in preparation of the psilocybin initiative, trying to get on the ballot, in the May election, this professional society got people together to discuss what does the future look like? And before doing that, the executive director of the nonprofit says, I'm just gonna write on this whiteboard now, everybody just shout to me why people use psilocybin. And you know, I grew up in like 
an underground rave scene. And this is my first professional psychedelic meetup. So I had no idea what to expect. And so before everyone starts shouting out their answers, she says, now, she's like, the, wow, she's just like, you know, because she invited folks. And I'm sure there was some sort of RSVP, but she was like, the minds in this room are so brilliant. You should just take a moment to just introduce, you know, yourself to each other. Turn to your right, turn, your, turn to your left. And I like one, I, I noticed I was definitely one of the young people in the audience. And I was like, wow, this is so cool because we're talking about psychedelics. And mind you, to my right, I meet an actual medical doctor. I meet an MD. And I'm just like, wow, just mind blown. Like, what brings you here? And he, he you know, shares his personal accounts. He's, um, and then to my left, I am introduced to a therapist. And I'm just like, wow, this is so cool. And so like just going to these meetings, being in community, I learned so much. And this was really like helped kind of jumpstart even my own healing, you know, and my, you know, just adding to my own education and knowledge of the potential, the therapeutic value of, you know, these, these medicines, these tools. Um, and so some of the things that people shouted out that day, cluster headaches, migraines, um, addressing that. People talked about it, um, the ability for when on psilocybin mushrooms, you can be pro-social. You can also be creative. Um, people said, you know, tapping into my own spirituality. Um, people talked about s stuttering is, was one. Um, and there was even a very, one that I remember, it was like the ability to like, uh, learn new languages, I guess, you know, because you're, we're just opening up pathways in our brain. And so, you know, what keeps us from obtaining knowledge when learning a new language and in our adult lives, perhaps now on psilocybin, that's something that can be explored. Um, they talked about, you know, pain management, um, neuropathic pain. And I have a friend who also uses um, psilocybin for pain. And so all these things, you know, depression, anxiety. And so if you think of, again, like that question access, why do we need this? I mean, think of all the people that have gone through depressive states in their lives. And here's this like, you know, and it's been tested. You know, there's, there's research that shows that it's less addictive even than cannabis. And in some cases, you know, there's that study that shows that it is the safest out of all, you know, drugs. Plant medicine is what psilocybin medicine has been referred to. However, it's not a plant, it's a fungi. So I do sometimes, you know, um, yeah, like that that's just needs to be said. This isn't a plant, it's, a, it's fungi and it's mycelium and it's much more uh, than, you know, just the plant kingdom. Um, and mycelium and fungi, there's so many species, it's been around, um, on earth longer than even plants. And so I, yeah, don't necessarily like struggle with it. I understand why, because it is naturally de derived from the earth. Uh, so maybe that's why it's got bucketed into being called plant medicine. But if we were supposed to, you know, a proper term for it would be just entheogens, you know, that's what they are. Um, and that's what psilocybin is, it's an entheogen. So I feel that, you know, access to this medicine can benefit an individual's um, mental health and it should be an option available. And so I believe that we should have the right to cultivate. You know, we, we passed a measure in 2019 here in Denver to decriminalize the personal possession use and cultivation. I was also a part of that as a petitioner, one of six, the only BIPOC woman uh, out of those um, petitioners. Uh, and I believe no one should be criminalized for, you know, possession, use, and cultivation of this medicine. Recently, voters of Colorado passed the Natural Medicine Health Act also known as Proposition 122, and even before that, it was called Initiative 58. I was very involved in the process of 
the, even the beginning origins of, at that time, Initiative 58. I was able to see what Initiative 58, you know, the ripple effect that it had on the grassroots community here, myself included, um, how it was pretty much developed behind closed doors with, you know, affluent white men creating kind of the framework and rules and the intentions. Um, and then it was brought to community. And so as someone who is, you know, versed in policy and creating legislation, I've helped pass bills um, and pieces of policy locally within Denver and also statewide, I just know that there could have been a better approach to how the Natural Medicine Health Act initiated. And then you take, you know, the account of who's funding it, who's behind it, what were the tactics used? And I believe still that Colorado deserves better than the Natural Medicine Health Act. I was very vocal. I even ran uh, Initiative 61 in response to Initiative 58 because Again, I just fully believe that as a basis, we should start with decriminalization first. And then if you're going to provide, you know, the rules and regulations and kind of the framework for legalized access, that should be years in the making. It shouldn't be rushed. It should have various people at the table working together to create a policy that would that would work for all people and that it didn't benefit, you know, certain groups of people. And I would be very cautious about the type of funding and who was, you know, behind the scenes orchestrating the ins and outs of how a ballot initiative would become a law in the state of Colorado. And so am I happy with it, you know, looking at it and knowing, you know, my lived experience as someone who was involved from the very beginning? No. Um, am I here to stay and work within the framework now that the voters have voted and, and respect the will of the people? Yes. And so while happy, <laughs> not quite, but willing to stay here and ensure that it is, that the promises that were, you know, in the, in the initiative are carried out that the future of this medicine is equitable, affordable, and accessible for all people, not just the rich and wealthy. Um, and that if there is, you know, going to be licensure, that it is, again, accessible for uh, people of color to participate in this legalized access model and therapeutic model, and really also to protect the social justice and the personal use provisions that are stated within the measure itself. And so that's my just ongoing commitment, how I am as somebody who feels, again, just socially responsible and also very passionate um, that this is a movement that centers the people and the medicine first and foremost, and not business interests, that it's not this pay to play model. It's not, you know, these outside influences and a psychedelic elite calling the shots that will affect us as Coloradans. Now that we've passed the Natural Medicine Health Act and the future of these, of what, you know, psilocybin and now these other compounds that we've passed here in Colorado, um, you know, is there a risk of corporatization? And I, you know, again, my past being in as a medical cannabis patient advocate before we had a legalized industry um, in cannabis, I, you know, often look to where we are, you know, in cannabis today, you know, that now that we've legalized and we're 15 years into having a legalized cannabis industry, and to how that could relate to the future of, you know, psilocybin therapy, psilocybin access, psilocybin legalization. And I do worry. Um, I, I, I do worry. And it was part of why I was vocally, um, you know, just kind of bringing these concerns and issues, you know, 
to other people's awareness. I'm not really telling people on how to vote, you know, and we've already voted, but really kind of just like take a pause and kind of see what we've learned with cannabis and how it does relate to the future of the potential corporatization, you know, that these medicines have. Um, when you have a legalized industry that's taxed 20% higher, so it's bringing in state revenue through licensing, through taxes, through fees, and then you have, you know, so that's what we created with the Natural Medicine Health Act. There's going to be licensure. There's going to be a regulatory agency. There's going to be state derived revenue from having this legalized access model. And then you have, you know, the personal use uh, provisions, decriminalization, our right to grow, cultivate psilocybin, and even the right to share it with friends. I do worry that you know, and this is fact, um, when you look at compass pathways and you look at these um, people that are trying to patent psilocybin medicine through the FDA approved model, they include as one of the risks decriminalization. Why would decriminalization be a risk to these corporatizations, to these corporate models and these conglomerates and these corporations? It's because if people can grow their own medicine, how do these corporations then profit from that if people are able to grow their own? It's the same thing with growing our own food, growing our own cannabis, growing our own medicine. And if you look at even in cannabis legalization, you have these multi-state operators, these corporations, putting bills forward to not allow homegrown cultivation because that is a threat to their bottom line. That is a threat to the revenue gained from their businesses. It's capitalism, you know, at its finest. And so I do worry that we will see the same thing here. But what growing our own medicine does, especially for people like me who aren't going to be able to afford, you know, these hefty, expensive psilocybin therapy sessions, is that one, we can grow, I, we can grow our own. I can grow my own medicine. I can cultivate the species of psilocybin that I want. Um, I could put my love and energy, just like growing your own food, the joy that like getting your hands in the soil and watching something and then actually consuming it brings you, you know, whether it's, you know, like they say, like some junior mycologists say, it's like this new profound like hobby that brings people joy. And it also teaches a skill. They know exactly what's going in their medicine. So, and that provides access, you know, to anyone that can grow. It also, you know, doesn't provide access to everyone because not everyone can grow either, you know, and there's nuances with that. But for the most part, it helps provide affordable access to those who can grow. And I believe we, we need to focus, we need to ensure that those protections are in place. I don't think like, you know, um, the fear of having the right to cultivate our own f food and medicine, brain food, right? That's what this is also is, um, mycelium brain food. Um, you know, I don't see how that, you know, is, is, is something that, you know, that needs to be a huge concern, but it will be a concern to the corporation. So that will, there is a risk there that corporations, just like cannabis and home grows, that statewide conversation that's happening and the battle that's happening um, and why, you know, we could see something like that here in Colorado. Thinking about a time that I'd like to share about my use with psilocybin would have to be last year where I had a very ceremonial use um, with psilocybin, it wasn't, and it was with a friend. And, you know, the intention that we had behind it was really to help, you know, guide and shape some of like, of like my own actions in advocating for psilocybin here in Colorado. So 
there were ballot initiatives. There was Initiative 58, which is now known as the Natural Medicine Health Act, and also Initiative 61, and I was a co-proponent behind that. And so if I'm working on policy in order to shape the future of what this medicine um, is able to do here in Colorado, I thought it was very important to actually ask the medicine and to sit and um, really kind of have it guide me and how I was going to move forward in my, you know, sacred activism for uh, this medicine. So that's, that's one experience. And I took three grams and that's actually a lot for me. I usually microdose or I take about one gram. Um, I rarely do about three grams or three and a half, an eighth of psilocybin. And so this was uh, raw psilocybin. And then we uh, s used um, kind of like a tea setting where we poured water and we used, um, we created like a tea, if you will, a drink with um, our psilocybin medicine. And, um, in preparing for this ceremony, we really wanted to account, you know, not only our intention that we, you know, wrote out on a piece of paper, we had an altar where we got to bring um, things that made us like crystals and like photos of even, you know, um, um, anything that was inspiring for us to like call in. And so, I brought, you know, some of my favorite crystals, this uh, beautiful, like, statue I have of um, actually, you know, psilocybin mushrooms uh, that was casted with a real mold and it was um, decorated and, like, it was bronze, but it was from a real mold of uh, a c cultivated mushrooms. And also, I, I want to add that the mushrooms that we um, consumed and ceremony was also g cultivated by my friend. In 2020, just like most, you know, Americans, I suffered a lot of just financial insecurity, job loss, um, huge impacts to the revenue that like my husband and I had as a household. I went to applying for financial aid. Um, there was this program offered by the state, and I, the name escapes me, um, but it was a program that prioritized BIPOC women and small businesses, so I thought I'd have a chance. And you know, my work in activism is very publicly online, it's in my Instagram, you can go and see every event I've ever put on, um, educational events that I've put on, not only in cannabis, but in 2019, leading up to the psilocybin initiative and vote, I hosted a psilocybin mushrooms community like town hall. It was right here in Denver at the Mercury Cafe. It was free of charge and it was really to educate voters on psilocybin on, you know, and we led the, and it was like, there were hundreds of people um, packed in that upper room. It was one of the best events I ever put on in my life. But we started off with presenting research. So again, the research that, you know, we, that's out from you know, Johns Hopkins. Um, we had a researcher present that research. We had a therapist present you know, what she's seeing, um, you know, the benefits of psilocybin in a therapeutic setting. We also then talked a little bit about the campaign, um, what the intentions were, what we hoped to achieve, why we were doing this. And then we had a Q&A. And that was the framework of like a, maybe like a, oh, and then we also had a very powerful testimonial panel with veterans, with people that have suffered from um, sexual abuse um, to end of life, an end of life patient who uses psilocybin um, and to talk about their end of life anxiety. We had, and, and also what psilocybin has done and mushrooms can do for like your digestive health as well. And so it was a really a fascinating, amazing panel. But, you know, I, I just was the promoter and I helped put it on. I created the Eventbrite and I was like the, you know, lead person on just event execution and management and promotion. But again, and it was volunteer. I didn't get paid to put this on. I just thought it was a good idea. Um, not only, so in my application process for financial aid in 2020, again, like asking for, 
you know, um, just funding to get my consulting business, my event business, which is Influential X, off the ground, or just like some financial security, like some sort of grant um, that I could perhaps do virtual events for the community I was asking for, or something else. Um, I got denied because I had put on this event and she said she saw it on my social media and because I had worked with a drug I was denied. And I kind of replied back and I said you know the US government is putting on educational events on hemp and hemp is still you know in the category of of cannabis and it's still kind of scheduled there and I was just like this is providing education the government is educating on this so I don't know I, I like reply back with something but to this day and something that I do want to also you know there's there's a risk involved even doing this interview there's a risk involved you know being a woman of color talking about this so openly and freely and um, we are stigmatized um, for drug use in general. And, you know, psilocybin is still stigmatized. So there are risks in participating in, in this study because it could come back and like, you know, you might get denied for government assisted financial aid. Another reason I want that I'm so passionate about this is that I've watched um, like I'm accidental overdose of you know due to opiates um, is the number one killer for people that are under the age of 50. So I've witnessed every year the loss of loved ones to accidental overdose and a lot of those stories started that they were prescribed oxycotton, hydrocodone, um, opiates, barbiturates, Xanax, a lot of and I'm talking about my lived experience within my peer group and the people that I know and the loved ones that I've lost have started with that being how they got addicted to toxic pharmaceuticals. Psilocybin is non-toxic. And so it, I've had a passion for natural therapeutics for health and well-being. Yes, with cannabis, but also with naturally occurring substances, psychedelic substances like psilocybin, ayahuasca. Um, and so that is also why I'm very passionate about this, being accessible and affordable because it can help with addiction, depression, anxiety, and it is a healthier alternative for SSRIs and other harmful pharmaceutical prescriptions.